Um, let's get right into it. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Probably will be very brief this evening. Probably. <laughs> That's not a guarantee. But it is a hope. Brenda. Um, I'm sorry, I couldn't help it. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 58. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Perfect text reads this way. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Father, Lord, I just ask you to hide me behind the cross now. Use me to say those things that are pleasing to you and nothing else. Help me, Father, to be a blessing to your people. God, encourage us tonight, and we'll thank you for what's done. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Steadfast. It's kind of an odd word. Most of the time, if you ask somebody, you know, what a word means, most of us think we understand words pretty good, and, and that's good, but I really like to read definitions. I'm big about reading definitions, always have been. Uh, if you've listened to me very much, you know I believe you need a King James Bible and a dictionary to know what God wants you to know. And that dictionary is real helpful if you have not had an education sort of like me. Uh, you have to learn what these words mean. So, I want to look at steadfast for just a second. I'm going to I'm going to break this down just kind of short, and it won't. Like I said, we won't be here very long tonight. But steadfast is a is a strange word. He said it, it means this is Webster's 1828. By the way, if you can get this app online for your phone or for your computer or anything else, if you want to know what an English word means, that's the dictionary. Amen. Webster's 1828. That is the dictionary. That's what you need. King James Bible, Webster's 1828. You're in good shape. So, fast, fixed, firm, firmly fixed, or established as the steadfast globe of the earth. In other words, it ain't changing very much. That's something that ain't going to be different. And I like one or two of these is a lot better to me than others. But the second definition is constant. Think about that. When he said, be ye steadfast, he means constant. That means always doing the same things. It's like showing up Sunday morning and Sunday night. Showing up on Wednesday when you can. That's steadfast. It's constant, doing the same thing. He said resolute. You know, we sing that song, I am resolved to follow the Savior. Well, I mean, we make our result. We, we decide. You know, I've been saying this a lot here lately, but you decide. You make your own choices what you're going to do every day. Now, I don't care what they are. You choose what you'll do every day. You can determine that I will be there when I can or I will do what I'm supposed to do when I can. That's up to you. And the reason we don't do the things that we should do is because we decide not to. And that's, that's rough and it's hard, but that's true. And I like this one right here, not fickle or wavering. Not fickle. Golly, people are fickle these days, ain't they? I mean, think about the people that you know in this, in this world today. They are so fickle, you can't please them doesn't matter what you try to do, you cannot please people these days. So we ought to be the least fickle people in the world. If we're going to be steadfast, to be steadfast, we ought to not be fickle at all. I mean, I know for years I've been to this church. For years I've been to this church. And if Preacher Lawson's on vacation, you can mark the empty seats. That's fickle. Really is what that is. That's fickle. Because he's going to put somebody in the pulpit to preach. We're going to have services at our church every Sunday, whether he's here or he's not here. Doesn't matter who's teaching, who's preaching, somebody's going to be here. But we got a fickle crowd sometimes, and I'm thankful for the crowd that's here. Y'all can say we're not fickle right now. I mean, you can look around at the empty seats that are here. It's Father's Day. Okay, we got Father's Day today. So a lot of people are with their dads. A lot of people went to other churches. A lot of people, you know, have had things going on they couldn't make it. That, we understand that. That's not the people I'm talking about. Y'all know who I'm talking about, and y'all know who you ain't. So thank God if you're not fickle. We ought not to be fickle people. But listen, do you know why our, our, 
we shouldn't be fickle or we shouldn't be these ways. It's because our steadfast hope, see, our hope is steadfast. That's the thing. We can be steadfast because we have a steadfast hope. Look in Hebrews 6. He said this in 17, 18, and 19. Wherein God, willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath, that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us. Amen. Which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil. Our hope in Jesus Christ is steadfast. He's never going to change us. I will never leave you nor forsake you, he said. We will never have a time that he'll forsake us. He will always be there. He will always be steadfast for us. Therefore, our hope and us, we can be steadfast in him. See, it's always going to be in him to begin with. You're never going to be steadfast in yourself. You don't have it in you. None of us do. We are creatures are weak. We're weak. He called us sheep. We're the sheep of his pasture. Sheep need a leader. They can't do it on their own. That's because they're sheep. They're dumb. And I hate to say that, but that's the truth. So how do, we, how do we become steadfast? How do we do this thing? He said in Job 11, 14, and 15, If iniquity be in thine hand, put it far away, and let not wickedness dwell in thy tabernacles. For then shalt thou lift up thy face without spot. Yea, thou shalt be steadfast and shalt not fear. We need to turn from those things we know we ought to turn from. I mean, it ain't that difficult. It's not that hard. We don't have to, you don't have to have a list of rules. I don't have to put it on the wall up here. You need to turn away from this, 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 and this. You know in your heart. Listen, I tell people all the time, they say, well, you know, there's this going on. Well, can you pray for it? Can you bow your head? If you, I hear people say, well, there ain't nothing wrong with a glass of wine every now and again. Really? Can you bow your head over it and ask God to bless it? That's all there is to it. It's pretty simple. Yeah. You know, how many people you know say, Lord, bless this Budweiser here and not one of them. No. You ain't going to get by with that. No. It ain't, it, like I said, you don't have to have a list of rules, one, after, one, two, three, four, five. You know what you ought not to be doing. Turn from it. That's how you start to be steadfast. You turn from that stuff. You know what Peter said? He said, for your adversary the devil walketh about seeking whom he may devour, who resist steadfast in the faith. We have to resist him according to what we know of the faith. We have to resist him according to what we know of the word of God and the power of Jesus Christ. That's how we resist the devil. Steadfast in the faith. So when we do those things, that's when we figure out we can, we can turn away from it. I'll put my definition in my pocket. Listen, look at Psalm 78. How to remain steadfast is pretty simple, really. Psalm 78, he said, Give ear, O my people, to my law. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old, which we have heard and known and our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from their children, showing to the generation to come the praises of the Lord and his strength. And his wonderful works that he had done. She sang about that just a few minutes ago. We ought, to be, we ought to be praising God. How do you stay steadfast? You talk to your children first. That's what he said. Well, we won't be, we'll, I don't want to mess that up. We will not hide them from their children. We ought to be talking to our kids about that. Fathers, it's Father's Day. You ought to have an audience today. You ought to have been able to talk to your kids today about the things of the Lord. That's how you remain steadfast. They know no matter what day it is, you can, they're going to hear from you about some of that stuff. They know, what you're, they know what you're doing. If you remain steadfast in front of your kids, they know how you live. There's nobody that knows you better than your wife and kids. Your kids know what you are. They know how you act and how you behave outside the walls of this building. You know, we all look real good when we come in here. All of us have got our ties on and, and we're all sitting straight up and we're all looking forward and everybody's paying attention. What about outside? That's, I mean, that's, I, I'm, I'm, now he done went to meddling, right? Anyway, for he, ha, he established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers that they should make them known to their children, that the generation to come might know them, even the children which should be born. You notice how many times he said children right there? You know what the hope is? The hope is that we'll pass this faith to our kids. The hope is that we'll pass this down to our families, and our families will keep continuing it on. That's how, been, that's how they remain steadfast. <coughs> <coughs> 
excuse me, that they might set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments and might not be as their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation that set not their heart aright and whose spirit was not steadfast with God. Yeah. See, that's the thing. When they see you're not steadfast, they won't be. They won't be. They just won't be. You cannot live like hell on earth and expect your kids to be any different. It's not going to happen. So be ye steadfast. Steadfast. It's done by keeping his word. It's done by his word. Always it's done by his word. It's never done any other way. Never. Ever, the longer I live and the, and the more God shows me, the more he teaches me about this Christian life, it's always about the book. It never, ever goes any other direction. It's not about the preaching. It's not about the singing. It's not about how we gather together. It's about what God said. That's what we need to focus on. That's where our priority ought to be. That ought to be what we put everything in. Our whole hope is in this book, right? I mean, everything you know about Jesus Christ, you got it from this book. See, we have not followed cunningly devised fables, Paul said, or Peter said. We have not. This is what we've got. We've got a book. So we should be steadfast and unmovable. Now, unmovable is a pretty easy definition, that which cannot be moved. And we sing that song, I shall not be, I shall not be moved. Hey, listen, we shouldn't be. Do you know what I think? That the only time that unmovable appears other than right here in, in 58, and I turn my page, the only time unmovable appears in the whole entire Bible other than right here is in Acts 27:41. <clears throat> That's when the, uh, the ship that Paul was on was run aground, and the front part, it said, remained unmovable, but the back part was tossed with the waves and broke up. So you think about that. The part that remained unmovable didn't break. See? That's what's going to happen in any church. The part that remains unmovable will not break. What's, what's falling off the back of the ship here? What's falling off the, the, the back of the, the boat here at Temple are those that are removable. They're movable. They won't remain unmovable. See, when you remain unmovable, you can't be shaken. When you remain unmovable, there's nothing that can fix, nothing that can mess your problem up. Anything that comes or goes, it's not going to make any difference. They were in a mighty big storm right there when that took place. When they run that ship aground, they were in a big storm. But the part they, that stayed unmovable didn't break. Now, I don't, I don't know if that makes any sense to you or not, but it sure did to me when I got it. When the Lord showed it to me, it made all kinds of sense. Amen. Because, listen, we've got people here that have been here for years and years and years and years and years. They're unmovable. They're the fixture in this church. I've been here a long time. I've been here over 20 years now, 20, 22, 23 years, something like that. And I'm going to tell you what, I've seen a lot come and go. I've seen a lot come and go. But I've, there's a, a group right here that's been here just about as long as I have or longer. A lot of them have been here longer. They're unmovable. That's, you know what Paul told people? He said, follow me as I'm a follower of Christ. You know, there's some people's faith that you could follow here. In this church, there are some people here, their faith you could follow. But then again, there's some that ain't here no more that you used to think you could follow them too. So be unmovable. Be part of that generation that's never going to change. Be part of that group that's going to be here no matter what. When the doors are open, they can look around and say, there he is or there she is. They're going to be there. We need to be unmovable. On top of that, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Amen. Listen, we have so much to be able to do. God has gifted this church especially with, with the ability to do so much. We are worldwide in this church. I mean, people know what goes on in this church all over the entire globe we should always be able to abound in the work of the Lord here of all places. But now, abounding, I like this so much. Like I said, you think you know what words mean, and I always, you know, I, I think I understood what abounding meant until I looked at the definition. But he said this in Webster's. He said, abounding, having in great plenty. Not just having plenty, but having in great plenty. See, that's what we ought to have. We ought to, we ought to be more than just enough. That's, it's, it's, that's what abounding is. It's more than just being enough. More than just showing up. More than just taking your place here. Put your heart into it. So that's what it's about. 
That's what it's about. When you come in here and you determine that you're going to put your heart into this church, that means this place means something to you now. See, now this is home. Now this place is something that you can have in great plenty, not just be part of it, just, well, you know, I'm there. Yeah, I'll be there when I can, but, you know, don't look for me on Sunday night. Or That is not great plenty. He said being in great plenty, being very prevalent. You know, to, to prevail is to win. But being very prevalent is to always win. That's what we got. That's what we have in Jesus Christ. That's what he's asking of us. Actually, I think it's a commandment. I don't think it's an ask. I don't think it's a will you please. He said, therefore, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Now, to abound in the work of the Lord, we understand that we're saved by grace. We're Baptists here. You know, and I smile when I say that because I'm glad to be a Baptist. I really am. I didn't start life out as a Baptist. I didn't start my Christian life out as a Baptist. I was saved in the Assembly of God Church. And I was under a works-based system that I couldn't get out of. And God showed me the truth. Thank God. You know, y'all, I don't know, I don't know how many of you in here remember Marvin Lenhart. But I love Marvin Lenhart. I love that old man. I'm telling you what. That was one of the finest men I ever knew. He was a pastor of the Church of God who believed you could lose your salvation, who believed in all the, the, the things that Church of God and Assembly of God believed that are a little bit cockeyed, and he got to listen to him. And he got to understand a little bit about eternal security. Do you know when Marvin Linhart got a hold of eternal security, he ran like a scared rabbit with it. You couldn't slow him down. He had to tell everybody that he knew you couldn't lose it. There's no way to get rid of it. You can't do anything about it. Marvin could not be changed. He was unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Why? Because he knew his work wasn't in vain. Amen. Listen, if you don't have that hope, if you don't have the hope of eternal life, which Jesus Christ that promised cannot lie, if you don't have that hope in you, I, don't, I understand why you don't really feel like working. You could work your life all the way down to the end and make one mistake at the end and you're lost. Yeah. But we can't do that. Right. See, that's impossible for us. We're born again. We're eternally saved. Amen. So everything you do now, and I, I said this this morning at church I was preaching at this morning, but the thing, you know what blows my mind about the Lord is he puts the power within you to do anything you do. <coughs> Jesus Christ said, apart from me, ye can do nothing, right? So there's absolutely nothing we're capable of. So anything you do, the work that you do for the Lord is done in the power of Jesus Christ. He gives you the will to do it, the knowledge to do it, the power to do it, and then helps you do it, and then gives you credit for it at the judgment. Amen. How does that work? I mean, how much better can you get? Amen. It's like, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you to go wash my car, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to run the water. I'm going to fill the soap bucket full. I'm going to take the, the rag myself, and I'm going to rub it on the car. All I want you to do is just hose it off, and you get credit for washing the car. That's amazing to me. That's mind-blowing to me how he could do that good for us. Do you know what he said in Titus? I want, always abounding in the work of the Lord right here. Listen to what he said in Titus. He said in Titus 3, 5, Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according unto his mercy hath he saved us. Okay? He saved us by mercy. According to his mercy he saved us. Not because we worked our way into it. We didn't do enough. We couldn't be smart enough or, or pretty enough or work hard enough. But he saved us because he loved us. He saved us because he's merciful. But in Titus 3.8, three verses later, three verses, this is a faithful saying, and these things I will that thou affirm occasionally. No, 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 no. No, anybody that reads their Bible understands constantly is the word there. Constantly. Why would you need to affirm something Constantly. Have any of you got kids? <laughs> How many times did your child do it the first time? Over and over and over. We have to be reminded. Peter said, I remind you of these things. I bring these things to your remembrance because it's good for you. He said, these things I will that thou affirm constantly that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto God. Amen. Did he say God? No, it says men. These things are good and profitable unto men. The good works that you do are not, you're not benefiting God in any way, shape, or form by doing those good works. You're benefiting one another. 
You're benefiting yourself. It's like I said, the reward comes to you for doing the work that God put in you to do. He intends for us to do good works. If you read Titus over and over and over and over, in every chapter in Titus there's works. But he makes sure you understand it's not by those works we're saved. Those works are for, for us. They're for help, the, for the body. That's what we are. So it's for help. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 is the perfect verse. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. But verse 10 is even better. It's even better. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. God determined before he saved you, you ought to be doing something for him. See? That's why he said, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Do more and more and more, abounding, jumping. It's like a kangaroo bounding over the tops of these things. We ought to be working like that. Why? For as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. It's not in vain. Everything we do is not in vain. Do you know how we know it's not in vain? It's, it's not in vain because of the therefore. The therefore. Thank you, little brother. You're a fine young man. Ah, he must have been able to tell. <clears throat> therefore. You know, I skipped over that because I wanted to. Therefore. Old preacher I used to listen to all the time, he said, anytime you see the word therefore, won't you back up and find out what it was there for? Because that's what's important in that verse. The therefore is the important part of this verse. What is he telling us? Why should we remain steadfast and unmovable and always abounding in the work of the Lord? Therefore. That's why. Therefore. And now you can take therefore and say because of this. That's why. That's what it's there for. So because of what? What is it that he tells us about that should, why should we be that way? Why should we always remain un, steadfast and unmovable? Because of these things that he just got through saying in this chapter. Right. This whole entire chapter is about why we remain steadfast and unmovable. The whole entire chapter. Now there's perfect, beautiful things in that chapter. The gospel. The very first thing in the chapter is the gospel. See, we hear about the gospel all the time. You know, the gospel of, of grace and the gospel of, uh, of mercy and all these different gospels you hear about. But the gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the gospel. That's what will get you saved. That's what will get anybody saved. There's enough in, that, in those four verses, in the first four verses, to save the world if they'd only hear it. So the gospel, he said this in Ephesians 1.13, In whom you also trusted after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. In whom also after that you believed you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. See the gospel is what gets us in the race to start with. We're not born again because we think we are. We're born again because of the gospel. Nobody ever woke up one day and said, I think I'll just get saved today. I believe today would be a good day for me to be born again. No, 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 that ain't how that works. That ain't how that works. Jesus Christ speaks to the heart of the lost. He draws the sinner to himself. Once he's drawn the sinner to himself, they, they accept that drawing. They accept the sacrifice that he made for their sins, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. That's the gospel. That's how you get saved. So once we are saved, then we're in a race. See, we can do something then. Always abounding doesn't matter unless you're saved. You can work and work and work and work and work and it ain't going to do you any good. But the thing about it is the lost don't usually do too much work. You got a bunch there that Jesus talked about one time. They come to him and said, didn't we do great works in thy name and, and cast out devils? And he said, depart from me. I never knew you. So the gospel has to come first. That's what it's there for. Because of the gospel, we can be steadfast and unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. He said there were eyewitnesses. In verse 5 and 7, look at verses 5 and 7 here in 1 Corinthians 15. Paul said, And that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. After that he was seen of above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. After that he was seen of James, then of all the apostles. And last of all he was seen of me also as of one born out of due time. 
Listen, there are witnesses. Because there are witnesses, we can remain steadfast and unmovable. But you know who the witnesses ought to be now, right? They ought to be us. They ought to be us. Listen, nobody in here, not everybody in this church is a preacher. We've got quite a few in here, and that, I hear people say, well, I'd be so nervous preaching to all them preachers in there. I'm not. Every one of you guys that stand in the pulpit and preach, you know how nervous you get up here. I bet everybody in here has prayed for me at one time or another. While I've been up here preaching, somebody said, help him, Lord, help him, Lord. You know he's dumb. Hey, I'm thankful for that. But not everybody in here is called to teach a Sunday school class. Not everybody in here sings at the piano. Not everybody does. Listen, but we are all called to be a witness. We have a ministry that God has given us. If we're born again, you know how you got that way. And all God wants you to do is tell somebody how you got saved. That's all he requires of us. You tell somebody what happened to you. That's all we need. So because of the witnesses, therefore remain steadfast and unmovable. He said also in, in verse 51 to 53, talked about the rapture of the church. Now, folks, there ain't much that gets me more excited than the rapture of the church. I'll be honest with you, I can't wait one day. My favorite part of an airplane ride is the takeoff. Y'all y'all like that? I mean, I, I am. I like it. I love it. I sit down on the airplane, and that the force of that motor starts taking off, and it pins you to the back of that seat, and you just feel that G-force as you're taking off. Do you know how much faster we're going to go than that one day? Hey, I still like amusement park rides. I like roller coasters and fast motorcycles and all that stuff. I can't wait for that day. One of these days, I'm going to hear Rick Owens come up hither. Zoom, go. I'll be so fast my clothes won't go with me. They'll fall right where I was standing. You think about that? You ever think about that, Tom? These, these rags ain't going up there. You know that, right? These rags ain't going up. Neither is this old nasty blood I got. My blood's corrupt. One of these days when the rapture of the church takes place, there'll be a pile of bloody clothes everywhere there was a Christian standing. Boy, it's going to be a wild day, isn't it? I mean, a wild day. We got that to look forward to. We can look forward to that. Listen to what he said. Where am I at? What page am I on? Does anybody know where my Bible's at? 51, verse 51. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, and that don't mean Donald, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. We must. It's got to happen, see. You've got to go away from here different than you're standing here now. When he calls your name at the rapture of the church, a lot of people don't like that word, but I don't even care if they like it. I've always used it. It's been, it's been the word. I know what it was by that. You can call it the catching away if you want to. It's okay. I still call it the rapture. I'm going to. But listen, that thing's going to take place one of these days, and we're going to be gone. Do you know what he said in 1 Thessalonians 4 when he was teaching on the rapture in that verse, in that chapter? He said, wherefore, comfort ye one another with these words. It ought to be a comfort to us to know that one day he's going to snatch us out of here before the tribulation period starts. and We're not going to be suffering through that mess. He's going to take his bride away and we're going to be gone from this place ever to be with the Lord ever to be with him. We'll never be separated from him again. We'll never, see, we'll never be separated from our loved ones again. One of these days is going to be a perfect day. A perfect day. That's what we're going to look for. Because of that, therefore, be ye steadfast and unmovable. And then the final victory. Thank God for that final victory. Look at verse 54. So when this, in, when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Therefore, therefore, you know, we can be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord because even death has no hold over us. Amen. Even death can't hold us. We're, not, we're unstoppable. 
See, that's the thing. There's nothing that can hinder us. There's nothing that can stand in our way because the king of the universe, the one who created everything, is the one who pushes us to do these things. He's the one who inquired of us to do those things. He's the one that gives us the power to do those things. Do you think his power can be thwarted in any way? I don't. I think if he told you to do it, he'd give you the power to do it. I don't think he ever called any man to do anything that he couldn't do. Listen, God doesn't need your ability. God needs your availability, and that's it. That's all he needs from us. So therefore, in light of the gospel, in light of the witnesses, in light of the rapture of the church, in light of the fact that even death can't hold you down, therefore, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor in Christ is not in vain. Hey, that's good, ain't it? That, that's, that's something that we ought to be able to cling to. That's something we ought to be able to hold on to, especially in the days we live in. These are rough times, folks, rough times. I mean, the places where we, where we go and the things that we see in this world today, do you all know that the Methodist church so right now has a drag queen preacher? Do you ever, y'all know that? That's the sickest thing I've ever heard of in my life. Yeah. I never heard of anything worse than that. Other, the only worst thing I've heard of than that is they're trying to bring these things into our schools for our little elementary school kids to see, to teach them about that garbage. The times we live in, we really need to be steadfast and unmovable right now. Amen. Right now, above all, we need to be. Folks, I, I'm praying that God gave you something. I, I I really hope that, that we can see our way to being steadfast in this last day. I'm thankful for the opportunity to preach. He's always, he's always opens doors for me in the, in the strangest ways. I, it's, I, I told somebody I was going to tell this earlier, and I, I forgot it until just now, but the Lord brought it back to my mind. A preacher called me this week and asked me to, to teach Sunday school today. And I said, yes, sir, no problem. I can do it. And then hung up the phone, we talked a minute, and I hung up the phone and, and went to eat and supper. About two minutes later, and the phone rang again. It was Preacher Lawson. I went, okay. <laughs> yes, sir. And he called back. He said, brother, I'm, I made a mistake. He said, I was, what I want to do is have you preach Sunday night. I said, okay, that'll be fine too. That's not a problem either. And then it wasn't just a little while down the road, a friend of mine called me. That uh, me and Brother Dewey have been trying to help out a lot. He's hurt his back real bad, and we've been preaching for him a lot. And he called me, and he said, man, I'm hurting bad. He said, I was planning on preaching Sunday morning, but I can't. He said, can you come and preach for me Sunday morning? Well, three minutes earlier, no, I couldn't have. But then three minutes later, yes, I could have. And the Lord, I, listen, I am. you can call me naive if you want to, but I believe the Lord did that. I believe he puts people where he wants them to be. I believe he moves things the way he wants them to be done. And if you do something, you have an open door to stand in his name, it's because he gave it to you. And he made a way for it. And he made a way for me to be down there this morning and a way to be here this evening and still stand and, and, and preach what he told me to preach. I'm going to tell you something. We serve a God that gives us all things richly to enjoy, the Bible says. That's what he wants. He wants us to enjoy. But do you know what he wants us to enjoy? He wants us to enjoy him. He wants us to enjoy spending time with him. We ought to enjoy the time that we can come together and fellowship as believers, but more than anything else, we ought to enjoy the time with him. Amen. So be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. And I'm done. Father, Lord, I do thank you for another opportunity to stand. I thank you, Lord, that you know all things, and you, you know me inside and out, Father. You know everything there is to know about me, and you still love me. And I thank you for that truth. Father, I thank you for these people in this church. Lord, you know they're my family, and I love them. I ask you to bless them, pour out your mercy upon them, and help them. And we'll thank you for everything done, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.